Hey, Fringe listeners. Being that Chad and Cheese is the world's most dangerous HR podcast, we should give a warning label. Well, they sure do challenge the status quo or even what's good. They're fighting for great and they are passionate and authentic. And you might hear some choice words. We're pumped to partner with Chad and Cheese to push leaders' innovation muscle. Check out this episode. It's one of our favorites. Sovereign is known for providing the world's best and most accurate parsing products. And now, based on that technology, comes Sovereign's artificial intelligence matching and scoring software. In fractions of a second, receive match results that provide candidates scored by fit to job, and just as importantly, the job's fit to the candidate. Make faster and better placements. Find out more about our suite of products today by visiting Sovereign.com. That's S-O-V-R-E-N dot com. We provide technology that thinks, communicates, and collaborates like a human. Sovereign. Software so human, you'll want to take it to dinner. Hide your kids. Lock the doors. You're listening to HR's most dangerous podcast. Chad Sowash and Joel Cheeseman are here to punch the recruiting industry right where it hurts. Complete with breaking news, rash opinion, and loads of snark. Buckle up, boys and girls. It's time for the Chad and Cheese Podcast. Oh, yeah. What's up, everybody? You know who it is. Your favorite meatheads, a.k.a. The Chad and Cheese Podcast. I'm your co-host, Joel Cheeseman. Joined, as always, the Venus to my Serena, Chad Sowash. <laughs> and today, we welcome Natalie Monbio, head of strategy at Hour One to the show. Natalie, welcome to the Chad and Cheese Podcast. It's Monbot. Monbio. Where yeah, are, we, get this are we sure <laughs> she's real? I'm not we're, sure. We, <laughs> yeah. Our listeners don't know yet, but but Natalie basically is with a, a fake virtual human organization so we're not quite sure <laughs> fake. she's even real natalie are you there Synthesized clones that's what synthesized yeah clones that's quite an introduction fake and virtual <laughs> uh yes yeah, so basically yeah my name is natalie monvio the irl me and uh my virtual alter ego has been known as monbot uh for quite a few years now even predating hour one um, i've had a slight obsession with AI bots uh, since the beginning. And in a way, mm -hmm. what we're doing at hour one is uh, the kind of most advanced iteration of what AI bots can do. So you've manifested it is what you're saying. What is Natalie about? Let's, let's figure that out before we get into the show. Natalie, give us a Twitter bio about you. What makes you tick? Sure. Well, from a work perspective, I would say that everything emerging technology, I'm an emerging tech and communications buff. So how does AI and other emerging technologies, how does, how does that shape how we can communicate with each other in uh, what might sound paradoxical in a more human kind of way? Uh, and I also, I am an avid outdoorsy person. I'm uh, an adventurous skier. I play a lot of tennis. I sail and I have an 11 month old daughter. You sail, talk about Ooh. that. Where are you sailing to? We just did a two day voyage, a mini voyage with our baby to Block Island, just off the, uh, just off Long Island. So yeah, that's something very highly recent example. That sounds pleasant. Did you have a picnic when you got there? Uh, we had all sorts of picnics, wine and there cheese on a sailboat. We petted, uh, alpacas. Uh, we did it all. Dang, this is, that's pretty sexy, but not as sexy as 20 million in the bank or what it looks like 20 five million in total natalie our one just received uh some some new new cash new funding what well, what's what was that for tell us more about eight hour one and then start tying in that that funding what are you guys looking to do what is our one looking to do to be able to disrupt a lot of different industries absolutely so we are a virtual human company where we basically make virtual humans based on real people for the world of work and we do this in order to be able to uh, scale and improve communication so instead of uh, communicating in text form, which is how the majority of business is taken care of these days. People who don't have any production skills, don't have any um, tech skills, can basically generate content for their business to help them communicate better. Content that being video featuring virtual humans, which could be their own virtual twin, or it could be uh, a virtual twin for hire. And we can talk a little bit more about that 
as well. And we also set these virtual humans as something very new and ties into our investment into 3D immersive environments. So just from plain text, you can now generate immersive video experiences to engage your customers, to engage your employees uh, in a very flexible and pretty instant way. So you type in some text into our platform, you select a virtual human uh, or an avatar, you select uh, from a variety of 2D or 3D virtual templates or environments, and you add in your imagery and you hit a button and a few minutes later you have these complete videos uh, which uh, are more engaging than kind of text-based communications. Well, welcome back to the Matrix kids and and Joel, the virtual twin for That's hire ha- had nothing to do with you, okay? Just so that you know, the virtual twin for hire is not a thing. Uh, using oh, a little a- secret, Chad. A- yeah, yeah, yeah. U- using AI to be more human is what you guys have have championed, and 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 we we believe that uh, on our podcast. We've been talking about that for for years, but it might mean something different. So, what does it actually mean to you in hour one? How are you using AI and quote unquote virtual humans to be more human? So I should probably start by saying the best way to communicate with somebody else is face-to-face, in person, live, um, and but that's not always possible or and it's not scalable. And the, it lacks uh, flexibility and speed and the ability to translate content into different languages and all of that. Um, so what we want to do is be able to take some of the core elements of face-to-face communication and be able to scale that. And we use AI in order to do that. So you can basically, so how the AI works and how our platform works is uh, you can just capture a little bit of footage of you, or this is how we create some of our, uh, our stock avatars. You take a little bit of uh, footage in video, and we use that as the data from which to create your kind of virtual uh, representation. And so there's AI involved in that. So training data. Training data, exactly. And so... We, you know, we take a little bit of footage and that becomes the training data for your virtual twin. So the AI is involved in generating your virtual twin. So that's sort of stage one of two of where the AI is really involved. Uh, and then stage two is the ability then to just through inputting lines of text to be able to generate new content as though you set it in front of a camera, but you didn't have to do that because that takes a really long time. Production, video production in a studio, you know, having to get uh, actors, crew, on location, shoot, reshoot, all of that is very time consuming uh, and also very expensive and not very flexible. So you can't update that content. So the ability to program your avatar to uh, generate new content just from text also enables you to update and edit that content extremely flexibly. So you can keep your content fresh at all times. I'm really curious about the name Hour One. Is that like some 70s sci-fi movie hat tip that I'm, I wasn't aware of? Where, where'd the name come from? It actually comes from a song by the Scorpions. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like it even more. I'm so glad I asked this question. Okay, go <laughs> yes. on, go on. Yes. Song by the Scorpions. And it's basically that we are at the Hour One of sort of the, the future. So basically, we're starting again in terms of uh, what comes next. So it just feel, felt like an apt name. Is this song called Hour One or is it a line in the uh, I think song? it's called Hour One. I think it's called Hour okay. One. Okay. I've yeah. got my homework, homework ahead of me. Okay. Yeah. So we, we talked to a lot of companies and, and know a lot of, of organizations that use video in recruiting, right? They're usually embedded into job descriptions. They're usually, you know, when you apply to a job. Maybe a video from the hiring manager or who who your boss might be. Maybe a video from the CEO and the automated email that goes out to a an applicant. Those obviously have taken hold, but they tend to be organic in that it's real people at the company talking about, hey, here's what I do for my job, or here's what you'll be doing for the company. You guys focus on HR. What are the the case studies? What are the applications that are most prominent? when you guys work with an organization in HR recruitment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really at various stages um, of the HR experience. So starting with interviews or job posting, sorry. um, And as you say, embedding videos with each job listing. And that's something that is actually quite difficult to do if you have a lot of different job listings and you're posting new ones all the time. Now you have the ability to ingest the kind of the bullet points and the key you know, the key parameters uh, from the job listing and convert that into a video 
presented by, let's say, your virtual uh, HR representative. And it can be very on brand, tone of voice, the look and feel of, of the avatar that you've selected or that you even created for yourselves, like, you know, your own company, virtual HR uh, representative. And then you can also upload and, in, and integrate a lot of imagery. Uh, and mm -hmm. so you can bring to life the job listing in a way that is has not been possible before and to help you stand out basically um, from other companies. And you can make that very on brand. You can customize it to your, you know, your brand guidelines and all of that. So I'd say that's kind of the beginning stage. Then onboarding is another really popular area, uh, the use of our technology, because again, that might be an area where there's just a lot of text and a lot of kind of a very static experience. And now you're able to uh, upgrade that to make it more immersive and interesting presented by an on-brand character. Uh, and then a lot of what we do as, as well is around learning and development. So that's kind of a lot of dry content there that can instantly be lifted and made more immersive. Yeah. So ups, particularly up, upscaling is a, a hot topic in our space. So are these characters typically animated or are these real videos that are then sort of customized to what's being said? or both? So they, it's a really interesting question. Like, is it animated? Because I think that really gets to the core of uh, content creation. Today. Well, cartoonish versus real life. So they're photo real. Our avatars or our virtual humans are photo real. And so they are designed to mimic a person's facial expressions uh, and, and, and mannerisms, because we understand that that's you know, a very powerful communications medium. So we want to be photo real. Then, because we also create the environments for the video, so the backgrounds, and th that becomes a mix of animation and photo real, kind of borrowing a little bit from the latest in gaming, uh, which is clearly, you know, very advanced computer graphics, but, but photo real as well. So it's kind of this blend, I would say, um, in the overall effect at this point. So an example of what a company could do if they were creative, let's say it's progressive insurance. I have Flo as my spokesperson. Flo could actually talk about a specific job and what they do embedded into a job description. That could be one creative way that a company could use your tool. Exactly. So you, but you have IP like Flo. It's like, how do you extend the IP of Flo? And how do you embed her into a lot of different uh, environments and all through you know various touch points of the company? And then you can also do things like have Flo speak in different languages to localize that content or have Flo create many different iterations of that job description. You could even be customized by name if you wanted it to be. How many languages do you guys support? Around 50 um, okay. we can do, which is basically if there's any language that you want to do, we can pretty much do it at this point. You guys recently launched, um, I guess, a news reading s solution. What's your goal there? Like, are we going to end up going to channels and just seeing virtual humans read the news at some point? Or is there sort of a unique way that you're rolling this out to the to the world? Funny you should ask that. We actually already do have, uh, we've partnered with uh, a news company uh, called Defiance Media. And they've actually been using our uh, virtual human newscasters for a year already. And so that element of using a, a virtual human in news isn't necessarily new, but what we've just launched is a 3D news environment. So now you can customize any sort of 3D experience um, and it can be, it mimics a traditional news environment, right? You know, where you, uh, when you feel like watching, you know, news on whatever channel it happens to be on TV, broadcast news. So it mimics that, but actually there's greater flexibility because you can customize it and do things that aren't possible in, in reality. Because now we have these tools at our disposal to be able to animate and um, get more creative. Uh, than ever. So yes, yeah, so we do. So we do expect, and we do already have news media customers, and the benefit to them is they can stream news, and they do every two hours around the clock, and that is something that would have been impossible for many reasons using live human news news anchors. So um, they've actually created their own news anchor, and they're also integrating kind of a futurist who's a real person in real life, and then they're also you know leveraging him as a virtual twin within their content. So it's pretty interesting and kind of blurry. But I wanted to add to that is that's the news environment you being used literally for news. But if you are a company and you know the, the HR department wants to be able to present information in a way that is more creative and interesting and immersive, a company can create their own virtual newsroom 
or virtual news desk. And that's just kind of becomes an ownable format in which to deliver information. So why HR? I mean, you've got these great marketing applications where you could go and prospectively scale flow or a gecko or I mean there are a hell of a lot of other other ways to go out there and make the big money because the mark marketing has the big money HR does not have the big money not to mention HR is slow to adoption then you have this news piece where the obviously local and evening news they want better ways to scale and to obviously grow market and margin. So why are you even messing around with HR in the first place? (laughs) That's really interesting. So basically, we see HR as a place where there is a lot of flat content that can be transformed very quickly into something that is more immersive and interesting. And we do see uh, quite a bit of demand for that. The other thing that's interesting about it is it's while we do... um, engage a number of different verticals outside of HR, like news, as you mm-hmm. mentioned, HR mm-hmm. is a horizontal function uh, versus a, a, you know, a verticalized function. So it's almost like every company of a certain size has HR and has HR needs. So it's sort of this interesting um, horizontal and we built some very simple tools designed to make it as easy as possible or an HR department that doesn't have, because we're really targeting people that don't have production or um, kind of digital skills necessarily, um, or developer skills. So we see HR as kind of being that kind of um, fitting that, that that sort of profile. HR is also seen as a cost center. So that's, uh, that's also a negative. But, you know, many startups are creating solutions to problems that HR doesn't even believe exists because the pretty much the type of traction you need and adoption for, for HR usually is about five to seven years behind the curve. So what, what in the current landscape told you this was the market that you needed to try to crack and, and, and would they pay for it? Yeah. Well, I think it's really that we've seen response. So we've, we've seen HR departments actually respond and say they, they want this. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily kind of went out expressly to engage HR, we actually uh, been engaging a number of different verticals, ranging from e-commerce to actually e-learning is really where we've had a, had a lot of early success and kind of upgrading e-learning content to keep to basically scale instructor-led content. And then kind of as a result of that, learning and development seems a sort of a natural extension just by kind of being out there. And we, we've found that pretty large, kind of pretty conservative seeming companies have actually seen what we're doing and have actively and proactively engaged us for HR needs. So uh, one of the largest health insurers in Europe, as an example, came to us and uh, wanted to basically create more engaging onboarding materials, more engaging uh, ways to invite employees into upskilling programs and to kind of personalize those programs more. So that's you know an opportunity that just came to our way um, without us you know having thought of it before. And another one, Israel's largest shipping company as well, had a, had similar needs. So it's really that it's emerged that way. Um, and that's why, why we've kind of seen it as an opportunity to, to keep pursuing. Come on, face it. You've got to fill those wrecks with great candidates fast. And you've got to diversify your candidate slates, which means you have to diversify your outreach. And that is this way global secret sauce. Check it. This Way Global is a Google accelerated startup and their tech delivers qualified and diverse candidates through a network of over 3,500 diverse communities that reach far past traditional tech methods. Yes, I just used air quotes. Seriously, you're missing amazing and diverse applicants every day that are often missed by job boards, old processes, and plain old human bias. This Way Global is a recruitment technology focused on sourcing from diverse communities and then matching candidates into your jobs. Send them a message at contact at thiswayglobal.com. Mention Chad and Cheese and gain same day access to the tech. Stop checking boxes and start building diverse slates at thiswayglobal.com. 
So you talk about uh, being more engaging, and it, it strikes me that a dialogue is more engaging than a monologue. When do you guys get to the point where I can have a conversation with one of your virtual assistants, I guess, or, or, or people? Or is that something that you're not interested in doing? Certainly, we've seen chat bots in our space where it's it's more of a conversation, right? It may be text-based. But it's a little bit more engaging that way, where this is sort of a sit back and be spoken to. Where do you sit on being more of a, a dialogue that, versus a monologue? Yeah, so we, that's totally right. We started in video and it's a bit more of a sit back experience, but certainly on our roadmap and our immediate roadmap uh, is to create more of an interactive experience. And the way that we're doing that is we're becoming much more real time in the in our ability to generate videos from text. And I know you've interviewed very recently, um, you know, a chatbot company, and you've obviously know a lot about this space. And you also know that uh, a lot of these chatbot, AI chatbot companies, it's not necessarily that they're inventing content on the fly. You know, these are decision trees with a lot of permutations and options within that decision tree. And so if we can just be quick enough to be able to generate the content, the video content to populate those decision trees, um, that's actually something that we can already do and already sort of doing in, in, in places is to integrate um, with, with some of these chatbot companies to be able to deliver a video-based interactive experience. So definitely something that is that we're starting to do and that is coming. So the, the metaverse has gotten a lot of attention everywhere. And I, I sense that a metaverse taking off would be really good for your company. Talk about how your product would engage or in, integrate with the metaverse, if at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So metaverse is really interesting. An interesting uh, theme that's come up in the last sort of 18 months, I'd say, where I think it's driven a lot of acceptance for what we do. And there's also suddenly it's just like avatars, but of course, I mean, it's, you know, people don't question the idea of kind of avatars in our lives because everyone's bought into this notion of the metaverse and avatars are essentially the protagonists of the metaverse. That said, I think people are kind of have got really obsessed with the metaverse without really thinking about what it's for and how useful it can be and, um, and the kind of why of how you would deploy the metaverse in a way that's truly going to help grow your business. So the way we kind of look at it is we're the metaverse for work, if you're kind of looking at the metaverse as a whole. And the metaverse, you know, is a kind of a nebulous thing. And many people, you know, many companies have their own um, definitions for it. But in many cases, it's a first person experience, which is largely around entertainment. So you want to be immersed in this content. You want to be this fantastical creature because you're in this fantastical storyline, if it's a game or some other kind of uh, uh, entertainment-based metaverse experience. But then if you think about work, and that's what we're really focused on, is virtual humans in the world of work. You, as a human being, don't want to spend all of your time kind of hanging out in a virtual world when you could be getting shit done outside of that. <laughs> so it's like but what you would like to do is delegate to somebody else, delegate to your virtual twin. So that's kind of our position on it. It's like you create a virtual twin that can carry out certain tasks for you. And today what your virtual twin can do is it can go off into the virtual world or into the digital world and it can do things for you like do routine presentations or answer routine questions, things that you you and you, all your full kind of human faculties and you know your, your full human um, creativity and potential is not required to execute those tasks. So you can essentially delegate stuff uh, to your virtual twin while you can basically do things which are uniquely human. And this is all you know within the work context, handle sensitive negotiations, uh, build relationships, all of these things. So in our view of, of the metaverse for work, you don't want to be immersed in this, you know, in the metaverse yourself as the human you, you want to be able to delegate um, to, to this virtual twin. So that's kind of how we look at it. And we're constantly building towards enabling your virtual twin to do more things for you in a, in a way that represents you uh, very well. So how genuine is that, though? I mean, if, if I want to have engagements and interactions with actual people, whether the, it is, you know, meeting in real life or in the metaverse, I mean, if I'm just interacting with literally a chat bot, a decision tree, how genuine is that? And how is that going to look to my brand if I feel like I'm actually engaging with a hollow, quote unquote, virtual human? Yeah, that's a really important question in that you know, people are going to be, if, if they were previously getting to interface with you and suddenly it's like, speak to my virtual twin, um, you know, that's not a good experience uh, for that person. So what we're always trying to do is basically upgrade something that would be text, let's say, 
and to be able mm -hmm. to upgrade that into an experience which is more interesting and immersive. So people are getting more than what they were getting before, or they're getting more of your presence, or you're able to generate more talks and more presentations and, and more content which wouldn't exist otherwise. The other thing is, certainly I would say um, from a tech perspective and also from just like a conceptual perspective, you're not really trying to pretend that your virtual twin is you. It's an extension of you and it's a representative of you. But our guidelines are to disclose that this is a virtual twin. How do you lock that down? That's that's the big question, right? So let's say, for instance, I have a virtual twin. I'm the only one who has access on the platform. But yet, I mean, I, I want to delegate it. So I want, you know, maybe admins or what have you to use it. How do you lock something like that, that down to yeah. ensure it just doesn't get out of hand? Uh huh. So I, I mentioned at the beginning that we're kind of building this virtual human economy. And as with uh, any economy, there, there are legal frameworks and commercial models involved. If you have a virtual twin with us, we basically, you'll sign an agreement with us, which first of all allows, gives us the permission as a company to create your virtual twin uh, with the data um, from your uh, video shoot. As a build to that agreement, uh, there will be permissions granted as to who can make that content using a virtual twin. So it could be just you, it could be your team, it could be specifically approved people. So in a way, it's not so different from, you know, you're an exec, you know, high level executive, and you have uh, an admin who writes some emails for you. And you basically authorize that admin to make to write those emails for you. So this is kind of a build on that. Well, well, I for one will be first in line when you create the zoom call doppelganger where I don't have mm -hmm. to sit on mindless Zoom calls all day. Anyway, you talk about passive income on the site, and it sounds like you're going to be able to roll out virtual use in a bunch of different languages and be able to scale this for celebrities and, and people that, that make money for who they are. Talk about the passive income opportunity at hour one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically we have these stock virtual humans, uh, some of which you see on the website. And these people have signed an agreement with our one, uh, where they're essentially our virtual talent and brands that, um, you know, want to make videos on our platform, they can select from these virtual humans. And when videos are made with these featuring these virtual humans, the real people behind them actually get paid a small fee. So this is the passive income. So they do one shoot, they sign an agreement with us. And within business context, the ones in which our one operates, such as HR, such as um, some news media, uh, such as uh, e-commerce, then they basically get paid a passive income. And these are kind of everyday people who are not professionals, they're not known. They're basically the equivalent of animated uh, stock characters. And then we also have is, you know, specific people can start like creators. So I think this is a space that is gaining a lot of interest and feel you know, in the, in the past year, again, there's a lot more acceptance towards this idea of, again, I think probably thanks um, to the metaverse, uh, the idea that you will have a virtual you and you can operate this virtual you to help you with your business as a creator or as a celebrity. So one guy, Ian Beecroft, he's a, you know, he's a futurist and he's a busy guy. Obviously, this is his territory. He's, you know, he's a futurist. He's very interested in AI and virtual humans and all of that. But his virtual human has essentially been hired by Defiance Media, which is the news company that I mentioned earlier. And every week he does a news segment and he does, you know, the, the tech update for Defiance Media and it's his virtual human doing it. He actually writes the script and he goes in the platform and he kind of assembles the video in a few minutes. And uh, actually there was one, I think it was just posted earlier today, um, a six minute segment on everything that's going on in emerging tech AI and, and the world of virtual humans. Who virtual twins, avatars, clones, synthesized humans. It's a cool and kind of scary world out there, kids. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. That's Natalie Mombio. I think it's Mombots. She's a head of strategy at Hour One. Natalie, uh, if somebody wants to find out more about Hour One or maybe even connect with you, where would you send them? Sure. You can uh, email me at natalie, N-A-T-A-L-I-E, at hour1.ai. You can find us on LinkedIn uh, and on Twitter mainly. Chad, that is another one in the can. Beep, beep boop, boop, beep, beep boop. boop. We out. I'm out. Thank you for listening to... What's it called? A podcast. The Chad. The Cheese. Brilliant.
They talk about recruiting. They talk about technology. But most of all, they talk about nothing. Just a lot of shout-outs of people you don't even know. And yet, you're listening. It's incredible. And not one word about cheese. Not one. Cheddar. Blue. Nacho. Pepper Jack. Swiss. There's so many cheeses and not one word. So weird. Anywho, be sure to subscribe today on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. That way, you won't miss an episode. And while you're at it, visit www.chatcheese.com. Just don't expect to find any recipes for grilled cheese. It's so weird. We out! Everything is changing fast in talent acquisition. And keeping yourself up to date with the latest thinking, technology and best practice is a challenge in itself. I'm Matt Alder, host of the Recruiting Future podcast, the show that gives you weekly insights, inspiring stories and cutting edge thinking from practitioners who are at the front line of talent acquisition. Recruiting Future is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hide your kids. Lock the doors. You're listening to HR's most dangerous podcast, Chad Sowash and Joel Cheeseman. Are you you fucking kidding me, dude? Is this thing even on? (laughs) Yes, that's what that red indicator on your screen means. Oh, Jesus. You know, we're closing (laughs) in on a thousand episodes. Yeah, a thousand. You think I'd get this right eventually? Oh, dude, no worries. I mean, it's all about great content over perfection. Thank baby Jesus for that one. Hi, I'm Chad Sowash. And I'm Joel Cheeseman, and we are the Chad and Cheese Podcast. Creative, huh? That's HR's most dangerous podcast. What exactly does that mean, Chad? Well, check out the explicit label for starters. Ooh, yeah, but any chucklehead can drop an F-bomb or two. True, true, but we have 40 plus years of combined experience in HR, talent, and tech, which means we know our shit and we're well connected. God world. But experience and our <laughs> network make for dangerous podcasts. But what really makes us dangerous is that we don't beat around the bush by asking bullshit softball questions. Unless it's a setup for a knockout, of course. Yeah, we're pretty famous for that, aren't we? What makes us dangerous is that we know talent is the center of every team, every business, and every single fucking economy. Yep, without talent products and services, your favorite brands just crumble. Our job is to stop the old 1950s line of thinking by challenging all of the bullshit we're seeing out in the market. And man, there's a lot of bullshit out there. Exactly. Talent is the center of everything in business, which is why you and your team need a steady diet of the Chad and Cheese podcast. Mmm, yummy. Available at chadcheese.com, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We We out.